I'm going to talk about one body of data. Now, talk about a way to make sure you have an extra nap uh, at the beginning of a work day. So I kind of disciplined myself from not putting up PowerPoint slides in eight-point type with all the data. And so, um, so what you should see this talk as is uh, personal musings about macro trends in the MBA world. Uh, the word macro is very important. The database I'll be using has approximately uh, 250,000 entries. And so it does not, if you're thinking of what does it mean for Booth or any top five or top 10 program, uh, the implications are not obvious from this data set. Rather, this is intended to paint a picture of changing uh, forces on the MBA education world on a worldwide global macro scale. So that's, that's the goal of this talk. And what is the data set that I'm going to talk about? The data set that I'm going to talk about is the data that GMAC collects. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, there are two GMACs. Uh, one of it has something to do with General Motors. This is not that one. It's the other one, which is the Graduate Management Admissions Council, which administers the GMAT exam. And so the idea here is to use uh, both actual test data, you know, who takes tests, where, how many of them, how are the trends in taking tests, as well as where do they send the test scores to. So if you're not familiar with the GMAT system, the way it works is you take the test and then you mark off the schools you want the scores sent to. So that also tells you where people are interested in going. And in this, in, the, in today's talk, I will only talk by region rather than by particular school as well as by nature of program. Are they applying to a two-year MBA program? Are they applying to an executive MBA program? Are they applying to a specialized master's, et cetera? All of this is gotten in a way that's completely airtight because they're actually sending the scores to those schools. Now, they may choose not to complete an application afterwards that the GMAC can't pick up, but otherwise it's a fairly airtight data set. So that's the kind of... Um, starting point of um, my analysis. And you can access all the data I'm going to talk about is public domain data, and it's available if you go and look up gmac.com. So you go up to GMAC and you look up all the things that I talk about are available there as public reports. And so uh, with the disclaimer that you should not interpret what I'm saying as uh, coded messages as to future directions of Booth. Um, uh, at Booth, we don't give coded messages. In fact, if there is anything we lack, it's subtlety. Uh, we, we, would, we would come out and tell you uh, st straight. Uh, rather, this is indeed my view as, and to be honest, as somewhat a citizen of the world, having you know grown up in one country and adopted another country as home. And so, First of all, um, there, it's not uncommon in the business press to read that uh, applications are down worldwide uh, for MBA programs. They are. We would be surprised if they weren't. And the reason is the MBA application, if you look at the time series of that and compare it to the time series of job placements of graduates, they're perfectly anti-cyclical. That is, when people, when the economy is down, we get more applications, and when the economy picks up, the applications tend to grow down. And by we, I mean basically the entire MBA, uh, you know, set of MBA offerings, and that is being reflected right now. So what I will try to do is talk about trends between 2007 and now, so that this, you know the minor blip that we just went through over the last four years, I'm being facetious, of course, uh, the Great Recession uh, does not necessarily play a role. Rather, we're trying to pick up structural trends. So what is the good news? The good news uh, is best summarized by actually a handwritten quote that Mark Twain wrote, having read his obituary, which was that the reports of my death was an exaggeration. And so the MBA marketplace is strong and thriving. 
score reports. So the number of places that scores are being sent to are up 15 per 14 percent since 2007. And that's the good news worldwide. The news for US is less sanguine. 55 percent of the exams were taken outside the US. The number of exam takers within the US has remained flat between 2007 and now. So it is basically the same number that took it in 2007. Um, the number of GMAT reports, the score reports that were sent to the US from outside the US has dropped. The, so it has dropped enough for a, to be not statistically significant. It's dropped from 82% to 77%. So uh, less people are sending scores and therefore applying to US schools as a fraction. And why is this important? It's because the maximum growth area has been outside the US. And in fact, the strongest growth area has been in East and Southeast Asia. East and Southeast Asia up 67% since 2007. So it's, you know, there are, this is a substantial rise, you know, in just four years, uh, this data set ends to, you know, academic year 2011. So just in four years, uh, the number of GMAT takers in East and Southeast Asia has gone up 67%. And a smaller fraction of that, that growth is being felt within the U.S. In fact, um, overall, if you take into account that the number of applications, a fraction of applications sent to the U.S. has dropped, and combine it with the overall growth, or in net, the, the number of scores sent to US has dropped. Uh, it's by a little bit. The other uh, not so good news if you're running an MBA program is that the interest in non-MBA master's programs is increasing. So in fact, uh, the increasing number of people are applying to you know, other specialty master's programs, whether it be in accounting or in finance, etc. And the number of reports sent to MBA programs has is actually down, according to the GMAC, from 78% to 67%. So this is actually, um, and the highest drop is in East and Southeast Asia. That is the highest substitution of specialty master's programs for MBA programs is in East and Southeast Asia. On the other hand, the job market is increasingly stronger in those regions. So hiring is up nearly 80% uh, to 80% from 72% uh, since 2007 in East and Southeast Asia uh, for these uh, and uh, more importantly, more companies smaller than a thousand employees are hiring MBAs in those regions and more companies are hiring MBAs. So what you're getting is a picture of increased demand uh, for MBAs, increased supply of potential candidates for MBAs in those regions, but a smaller fraction of that increase being felt within the U.S. So this is macro trend number one. For most of you who follow this world, uh, it is not that surprising, but it is indeed the case. Now, I'm required to prognosticate here because I made the mistake of using the word future in my uh, title of the talk. And prognostication is a dangerous science. If you want to be reminded of it, uh, you should go look at the movie uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, Kubrick got things wrong in both directions. Right? He assumed people would be going to Jupiter. It's still almost as hard to get there as it was in his time. We don't have regular flights to the moon or any orbiting space station. On the other hand, Kubrick also thought that in order to make a phone call, you would have to go into a booth and look at a screen this big. Right? So he missed the entire mobile phone revolution as well. Now it was after all now getting 45 years ago, so we have to cut him a little bit of slack. But in that spirit, you should take my prognostic prognostication with a big bag of salt. So here's prediction number one, which is, I think 
people have been talking about it but uh, until now i personally was not sure of the rate at which this would happen and that is that schools outside the us business schools outside the us will strengthen and take on a considerable share of the mba student body uh that's already happening the schools are getting much better and i hear i must admit somewhat shamefully of my ignorance of business schools in turkey i'm very familiar with business schools in east and southeast asia i'm not so familiar with business schools in turkey and in those regions the schools were good to begin with the iams have been good for a while but for example or seebs in shanghai has been good for a while but there is an increasing proliferation of schools and these will get better because it is not as if they are institutions just put up for national pride or anything like that there is a genuine thirst for talent as evidenced by the employment numbers and there is a genuine demand among the student body to go to these programs so once you have these conditions you will see strengthening of current institutions and proliferation of new institutions there's no doubt to it now for proliferation both in china and india there are regulatory difficulties it's not easy to start a school in either country or to start a program but even those i see as temporary obstacles so am i scared absolutely not at chicago competition is a good one you know this is accelerating that schools outside the us are going to get strong uh they will force us to innovate uh, beyond what we innovate on our own that is great and most importantly for the students from all parts of the world um we will see that uh there is a wider choice of offerings and that is actually a good thing so there's prediction number 1 so at this point i've earned my coffee and so you know it's the next 20 minutes if i don't say much uh, don't hold it against me uh the second question is deeper and is based not on the data set that is as clean as the what i talked about in the first part because it's based on survey data so the gmac the same testing organization once you take the test sends you a survey saying where did you apply how why did you apply to that place etc and so it's based on that survey data and so the question is how do people pick the location of the schools they apply to right on what basis are they making the decisions whose macro trends i have already described to you and it turns out in the the data set and its description is fairly detailed i won't read the numbers for you but rather if you look at what are the salient reasons for picking the us it turns out the reputation of the country's education system is of number 1 this is the primary reason the second is better preparation for a career which is also heartening that they're coming to schools in the us for the right reasons the third one is the attractiveness of the location itself now that is perhaps the most fragile of the three because as these other markets get stronger it is not clear how much that attractiveness advantage will remain for the us now i should not paint an overly gloomy picture here at all if you look even after controlling for every all of these effects the majority of gmat takers in every country or every one of the regions that the gmac looks at do apply to the us it remains still the number one destination by a lot especially and so i'll come to that in a second uh, which is what about american gmat takers but before i do that it's interesting to ask what are the top 3 reasons they would pick a location other than the us say europe or or a school in east or south asia and it turns out the first two reasons are the same the reputation of the country's education system and which uh, you know uh, and then better preparation for a career uh but the third reason is not the attractiveness of the location necessarily it is rather improved chance at having an international career so there is something telling there that is at least the perception if not the reality in uh, at looking at this data is that it is conceivable that some of these test takers believe 
that their chances of having an international career are higher if they were to go to a program outside the U.S. Now, this is aggregated over all programs in the U.S., so you should not read this as uh, an indication for, say, the two good ones or the five good ones that you know, right? So this is, this is rather uh, across all schools in the U.S., but there is something telling them. The second thing that is telling in the data set is for American test takers, of whom there are about the, it's remained flat over the last four years, having gone up a bit when it, the market was down, around 120,000 or so people take the test in the U.S. 98% of them apply only to U.S. schools. Uh, a significant majority of the test takers only apply to U.S. schools. So uh, what this is telling you is that if you want to... Um, uh, that is a positive sign as far as U.S. schools are concerned, right? Because it means that the U.S. marketplace still values the U.S. system more, but it may have implications in the long run. And so that's uh, the uh, second set of data. And what's, what's the kind of prediction that um, I'm trying to make on this? Uh, this one, I think, I feel that the significant majority of the U.S. MBA space will remain stable. This is not what everybody uh, who has my kind of job at other schools says, but I, I actually believe that because the numbers here are so skewed. It's not something that in the near term, say, or the 10-year period, that you'd go from 98 to 20. Right? It takes a while to move away from those positions. So at least in the medium term, I see the U.S. market as being relatively stable. However, I do see some consolidation at the bottom end. You know, so some of the weaker schools may have trouble, especially maintaining a full-fledged two-year MBA program. Um, uh, and there are two other two reasons for that. The second part of my uh, statement and the next, so why am I saying that? One is I already pointed out in my macro trends and, uh, statement that uh, there is an increasing number of people who are choosing one year, uh, sorry, not one year, but um, specialized master's programs. The distinction, by the way, between two-year and one-year programs in the data is that uh, both dropped, one-year programs dropped less than two-year programs, but two-year programs continue to have the largest yields as far as in this data set is concerned. Now, so, but for uh, specialized master's programs, uh, the growth is, is considerable. And the growth is not just in people applying, but also in employers who are willing to employ these people. <coughs> that is, the marketplace is moving away a little bit, at least in some portions, from wanting generalists right, who are trained in a generalist program towards wanting more specialized people. Uh, now, the fractions are still in absolute sense small. The numbers are there in the GMAC reports. But that is actually an interesting uh, trend as well. That, and which is why I feel at the bottom end where it's hard to maintain a generalist program. Uh, and it's hard to ha provide some effort at or some ability for students to have an international career or a chance at an international career, I do expect there will be some consolidation at the bottom end, but I expect the, the, the majority of the top schools, the top 25, perhaps even more, to become completely stable, at least in the medium term. So that's my second prediction. Um, the third prediction is about the proliferation of programs. This is the most uh, kind of exciting side of the space which is uh, demographics, expectations, et cetera, of people change, and they, uh, in this, in the potential MBA marketplace change, will change as the wealth of countries, in, especially in Asia, but also Latin America and Africa, changes. As they get wealthier and can afford, what you're going to see is a stock versus flow issue. We are in the flow mode. By flow, what I mean, you know, I'm using the standard accounting term, but the flow mode, which is 
we don't have a pent up backlog of people who wish they had gotten their MBA or could have gotten their MBA had there been enough opportunity at some point in their say recent past. Right. We are actually seeing we the, in the US, you would expect us to be seeing the flow where people who had the opportunity would have exercised those opportunities. But in these newer markets and one of the countries that comes to mind is Russia. Right. Where Russia's own inter business schools, Skolkova, etc. Relatively recent. Uh, and um, and so if you think of that, there is a, there will be pent up demand, but that demand will be spread across a age, experience and interest demographic that is more diverse than one that you see in a flow, uh, flow model. Because in a flow model, the people tend to be younger. And so if you look at, for example, the two year MBA program, 40% of the students overall across the whole set of offerings are under the age of 24 of applicants. Uh, for part time programs, only 24% are under the age of 24. And if you look at online MBA programs, of which there are only a few right now, only 20% are under the age of 24. And there are many ways to interpret this piece of data, but my interpretation of this is that it is an indication that the online provides a venue for some people for whom they're not in the natural deal flow of the regular MBA machine, if you want to think of it that way. And so for them, the online MBA provides an alternative venue, helping clear some of the stock of people who want to get the MBA and haven't had an opportunity to do so. Another reason is why do they take the to do the MBA? And one question which is worth looking at is do they do it so that they can change either employers or careers? So if you see what fraction of test takers intend to remain with their employer with the with the regular MBA, it's very small. It's about 13 percent. The vast majority, as we all know, want to do the MBA so that they can do something else, either a different function, different firm or start something on their own. Whereas with part time, it's nearly 42 percent intend to remain with their employers. And with online, it's 45 percent. So they're doing it for different reasons. Right. It's not necessarily as a career step in these other things. It's rather to acquire the knowledge, get credentialed, etc. And of course, the selection criteria of why you choose is quite um, um, uh, interesting. Uh, there is, if you ask why do people choose a program, the obvious suspects form the top five. You know, reputation of the institution, academic quality, quality of uh, fellow students, etc. Those the obvious ones form. But if you ask what's special about this program that doesn't show up in all the categories of programs. For the full time programs, it tends to be the ability to get placed, right? The ability to get a job when you graduate. That's hardly surprising. Whereas for the online MBA, it's not only convenience, which of course is part of the equation there. It is the nature of course that's offered. Because people realize that the online education is not a perfect substitute. You know, it's far from a perfect substitute for the in class experience. And so, rather, so you're asking what is the nature of the course so that how poor a substitute is it? Right? Uh, and so, the nature of the course, for example, drives decisions in that regard. And so, um, my take on this is especially based on the stock versus flow issue, at least in the medium term, there will be an increase of non-traditional offerings. Now again, uh, there is a there will be a place for the top well-established traditional offerings that is I see as completely secure looking at the numbers, but there will be considerable diversification. Um, however, I don't see them, especially the online ones, as substituting or completely eroding uh, the MBA marketplace. And part of the reason is if you ask um, what do you want to, uh, an MBA to do in your company? So if you ask recruiters in the company, what do you want the MBA to do in your company? In the GMAC database, uh, in the US companies, uh, it's basically what they would want them to do 
among various, there is, you know, various categories that people list, but I'm bringing up two salient features. So two things that show up in the U.S. is to help ex expand customer bases and to launch new products and services. So the innovation component and the marketing components come up in the U.S. databases. Whereas if you ask the same question uh, in Asia, in addition to expanding customer base, what shows up is they want to expand geographically. And they want to diversify their organizations because these are organizations that don't have that many MBAs within them right now. And so one of the reasons they're hiring MBAs is to bring a different viewpoint, a different skill set into the organization. And they want them to help expand geographically. So if you want to think about what are the logical implications of that, the online one, unless the platform is one oriented increasingly towards collaboration, towards uh, activities that are done collectively or where people can challenge each other, etc. If you have a platform that's isolating, where each person does the course on their own in a kind of one-off way, they are less likely to be attractive to an employer who wants to diversify an organization or to grow geographically. That's a hypothesis I'm making. We haven't tested that. But that would, so what I'm saying is, uh, even in these regions, and if you ask what are the desired traits you want in a p person, in the U.S., it comes out that the significant desired trait you want in an MBA is the ability to solve problems and to manage tasks. Whereas in Asia, the trait that they want is to manage people, to set goals, and to inspire others. So they are looking for softer skills as well because there are fewer of the MBAs there. And so they need these people to, to have leadership roles within their organizations, which again, in my opinion, makes it harder for a pure technological substitute to be that valuable in the market which is growing the most, right? And so that's, again, something to be thought about. Um, that said, you know, Clayton Christensen has written, if you haven't seen this, you, you should read, uh, well, you should read most of what Clay writes. But uh, uh, but if you haven't seen this, you should look at a book called Disruptive Classes. And Clayton Christensen is famous for the concept of disruptive technology. Uh, you know, he he was the one, who, for example, talked about how um, hydraulic power came to be. You know, the original earth moving equipment, mechanical power dominated. Uh, hydraulic was considered too unreliable and too weak to work. So where it was used was in like low end home gardening kind of earth moving equipment, you know, backhoe you use for your garden until the technology refined itself to a point where today it's unthinkable that a large scale excavator isn't run hydraulically. Uh, laptop batteries are another example. Uh, there are many examples where there were people who kept saying approximately what I'm saying now, which is, you know, these are imperfect substitutes. The technology isn't there yet. The technology gets used for something completely different. And then before you know it, uh, you know, it has had an impact. So its potential is there that that might happen. But right now, so my predictions are over a decade or so. You know, deans are a short-lived species. So we have a, you know, a view of 10 years out or something. Uh, 10 years out, I don't see it. I really don't. And that is not a reason not to experiment with this. And lots of people are experimenting, and it's great. So that is my um, uh, other prediction. And finally, um, do I have anything else? No, I'm done with my predictions. It's 8.45, but maybe for five minutes, I can take questions. Right. It's number of test takers, actually. Right. Uh, talk about a little bit the pressure on the margins of business schools and MBA programs and the discount that's going on. Where's, what are the trends there? I know that's probably not the data set. It's not. Uh, and uh, so uh, for uh, there is increased competition for um, uh, some segments of the student body. And um, and it is true that most schools uh, ha offer financial aid of some form or the other, uh, or at least facilitate 
uh, going to their programs to various degrees. Um, this does put pressure on schools that are solely dependent on tuition revenue. Um, if you look at the top 10 schools, for example, their P&Ls typically are a mix of endowment income, grants, philanthropy, and tuition income to varying degrees. This is the mix, but it's the same mix across the top programs. For them, it's easier to do this than it is for, and this is one of the reasons I believe that the low-end consolidation will happen. Uh, in particular, uh, I, I don't trust um, uh, some of the surveys that have been done on uh, future earning potential, ROI, et cetera. This is hard to predict, um, but, uh, but one of the things that's clear there is that there's a distinction between top 25 and not top 25. Uh, in overall earning potential and so on. So, so there will be some pressure on the margin. The question is how far up uh, the programs does, it, does that pressure go? Without going into details of what you were uh, you know, uh, suggesting as an application, I see lots of application in co as complements to the classroom instruction for technology, a lot of them, right? Uh, for example, uh, one of the things we are playing around with, uh, we don't know if we'll implement it or not, is a tool that allows teams to form across any of our four campuses. Because, you know, we have uh, executive MBA classes done in Chicago, London, Singapore, and we want, and the professor may be in Hyde Park, whereas the class may be in Gleacher, and we don't want to instruct them that way. That is, we don't want to teach them through necessarily a remote mode. But we can see that if somebody wants to have a team working on a project across these campuses, facilitating that, right? So in this kind of curricular and co-curricular complements, which is what you were talking about, I see a, I see a st tremendous and underexplored role for, uh, for technology right now. And I, I definitely do see that um, uh, because it, it, it does, you know, for example, all of this, right? I'm on the last of uh, the people who did it the old-fashioned way by printing the summary sheets of the data onto a binder. Uh, the generation after me would have brought their iPad on, right, <laughs> with everything organized on it. And, um, and so that's going to happen for sure. And we've, you know, uh, I think all schools to various degrees will take advantage of it. Yeah. Just to piggyback on the point was made here, uh, I'm going to may ask you to make another prediction. Given the value of the business degree from the United States, and given the uh, you know the decrease of applicants from overseas to the United States, and also given the fact that when we take a university from here to different parts of the world, the restrictions that that comes in with the political and the environment issue. Uh, the, the question is, how do you predict you know, these top universities here moving, taking our education back to where it's needed in the other parts of the world? So, um, so different schools have had different approaches uh, to this. And they're, they, most of them have already done some of it. Um, and so I'll contrast three different schools' uh, approaches here. Uh, Harvard has lots of locations outside the U.S. Uh, for example, they have a location in Shanghai. They use it for two purposes. One is for field research, where they can put faculty up who want to study local companies. And second is for uh, non-degree executive education. You remember my analogy of stock versus flow. They're, they're managers seasoned managers in companies in Shanghai can go to this classroom and take a custom course on some specialized topic from Harvard faculty. Uh, so that's one model. They don't run any degree programs outside, but they are influencing and educating leaders there. Then there, are, there is us who runs, uh, we run for specialized programs like Harvard in more places and in, in a few places, namely London and Singapore, we run an actual executive MBA program, right? 
Uh, and so that's another approach where we do. And then there's an approach that Kellogg does quite effectively, which is to form a partnership. And MIT does this too, which is to form a partnership. They form partnerships in different ways. Uh, but for example, the UST Kellogg partnership I talked about with Hong Kong is thriving. And it's, it's designed where some of the teaching is done by Kellogg faculty. Some of it is done by UST faculty. And, and so there, the student gets, you know, uh, both institutions in some sense. So there are many approaches. But to your point, again, back to this data set, what I want to stress is the number of people the top schools will influence compared to the number of test takers in these places. The top schools are not the right benchmark in some sense. While they may educate the most, in the most visible way, they are not going to hit the numbers that you're seeing here. So what matters more is how does the rest operate? And there it's less clear because it is difficult. For us, it's, uh, and for Kellogg and so on, it's difficult to maintain a relationship, substantial relationship or a substantial presence outside the US. And, but at the same time, I don't see it as a problem that has to be necessarily only solved by US or European schools. INSEAD does this, by the way. INSEAD has a campus, as a European school. We, INSEAD has a campus in Singapore. Um, I don't see it as that's the only solution. I see this as a potential for indigenous, especially in some countries, or even some local movement between, say, you know, I can't imagine that one of those countries sets up a branch in a country, you know, close by. Right? And so that's also a possibility. So I see that there is a variety of proliferation that's required if you want to cover this at this scale. Right? Well, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, what's most visible is the top programs, but the scale there is small. You shouldn't lose sight. It is true that they end up influencing leaders in the region. They tend to have disproportionate impact in the region, but it's still true that the number of people they will touch is small. Uh, maybe the last one, and then I have to, uh, you know, they may throw me out otherwise. <laughs> Short question, uh, your opinion on one, BM, one year MBAs that are being introduced by certain South schools? I think, uh, you know, um, like I said, I'm a fan of uh, product proliferation. I like the idea that there are alternatives. Uh, students will self-select into, you know, what they want from the MBA program. Uh, the two-year MBA has certain advantages, um, you know, beyond the, you know, firmer grounding in the foundations, obviously, because there's more time to do it. There is the internship benefit. There's the benefit of um, the ability to use the second year to correct or to add to s uh, strengths uh, that you have either, either correct deficiencies or add to strengths that you have identified in your internship. Uh, and a more relaxed way to look for your job. And for some students, the way to start a company while you're in school, you know, all of this is a benefit, but then there's a cost to it. It's a trade-off. So the, I don't see one as perito dominating the other. So, which is, it's not clear one's better or worse than the other. They both provide different trade-offs. One is lower opportunity costs, right? People talk about out-of-pocket expenses. You know, how much do I have to pay in fees they are smaller for most of our most successful applicants than their opportunity costs, the costs of sitting out the job market for two years, right? Uh, it's a, of course, the total cost is a combination of these two. And so there's the lower cost on one hand now, but then the question is, what's the overall ROI of this program? And which market are you targeting it for? You know, both in terms of ge geography as well as potential carriers into which people will go. It's also differentiation based on who you would like as input. Would you like to bring in people who are scientists, uh, you know, who haven't heard the word, you know, a demand curve, right? But would do perfectly well in your program. Or do you want to bring in business majors from an undergraduate institution? Right? And so, again, for me, I think I'm happy with uh, 
proliferation of choices. Choice is a good thing. And for us, personally, we feel that we would like to offer a platform uh, which results this trade-off in the uh, towards the end of greater investment now <coughs> in your education, right? This is a strategic choice that we have chosen to make. And um, I see it as justified. I can also see why somebody else would make another choice. And, uh, right? On that note, uh, thank you very much. So I spoke on some macro trends based on uh, the GMAC data, the Graduate Management Admission Council data, on uh, macro trends uh, in uh, uh, MBA education worldwide. So this is uh, discussing potential uh, future scenarios for MBA education. I enjoyed uh, the morning conversations uh, uh, event. Uh, I had a, a very receptive and interesting audience. I had a good interaction. I'm grateful to the Niagara Foundation for having set this up. I think uh, they're doing great work uh, trying to, you know, uh, achieve their mission of uh, having dialogue uh, in a nonpartisan, non nonpolitical way. I think that's wonderful. So, so it makes sense. Yes. Yes. Maybe going into the Middle East next year. So. It is. I still have a lot of.